Thank you very much, everyone, for attending our Tech Talk today. We are thrilled to have Dr. Ryan Pollick from University of Delaware to talk to us about mixture and growth mixture modeling. Last time Ryan came, it was in 2015, and it seems that it was yesterday, and he gave a fabulous lecture on structural equation modeling, so I really can't wait to hear, to hear him talk about uh, this topic, about growth mixture modeling. But before I introduce our speaker, let me go over some housekeeping issues. So, as you know, we will uh, continue to extend CME credits for our Tech Talks and our ID series presentation. We will distribute the information via email to those that registered for today's event. If you did not register prior to today's talk, you can still obtain CME code information from Lisa Maturo at Christiana Care. Her email address is lisa.m dot maturo at christianacare.org. So we also have a really great program starting in the fall. On September, on September 11th, we'll have an ID series with Dr. Regina Wright from University of Delaware, and she will talk about neighborhood disadvantage, brain health, and neurocognitive function. And then on October 1st, we'll have another tech talk and that will be Dr. Rebecca Herbert from University of Pennsylvania, who will talk about reducing bias and error in research using EHR-derived phenotypes. So that's something that we are all also extremely interested in as we do a lot of research about, about uh, with electronic health records. So again, I'm really excited to uh, welcome Ryan, uh, Dr. Polig here today. Uh, Dr. Polig is Assistant Professor in the Epidemiology Program and Director of the Biostatistic Core in the College of Health Sciences at University of Delaware. He obtained his PhD in Research Methodology with a primary focus on statistics from the University of Pittsburgh. He has participated in research from a wide range of fields, including health sciences, psychology, biomechanics, social work, and law. His interests include structural equation modeling, mixed modeling, mediation and moderation analysis, and study design. He has a very long list of publications and has led numerous statistical seminars in Delaware institutions. And finally, he's a lead statistician on multiple R1 grants. So I'm really excited to hear about gross mixture modeling, and thank you so much, Ryan, for uh, coming to give us this talk. Sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, just want to make sure that you can see the slide in the back. Yes, we can. All right. Um, so today I'm giving a talk on mixture and growth mixture modeling. And I just want to say that um, I put together the talk, or I should say I started putting together the talk before I heard back from Claudine on exactly what everybody wanted to hear. Um, so this talk is about 50-50 mixture and growth mixture modeling. Um, had I a bit more time, I probably would have skewed more towards the growth mixture modeling, which I think is what you guys are primarily interested in. Um, so a little apology up front on that. Uh, so you'll I, see that the, I guess I need to apologize. So. Oh, that's all right. Um, you'll see that the subheading of this talk is about identifying uh, homogeneous groups within a heterogeneous sample. And that's really getting at the core of what mixture modeling is, is trying to do um, and extending that to growth mixture modeling. Uh, so just a quick overview, I'll be talking about mixture modeling. Uh, I want to review latent variables really quickly, sort of conceptually to get everybody on the same page. Um, I'll walk through some examples of mixtures, and that is graphically, so that um, really are understanding sort of conceptually what we're talking about. Um, and then I'll sort of move on to mixture modeling itself and the sort of the primary um, indeterminate thing currently is determining the number of classes that you're going to extract from mixture modeling. And then I'll walk through an example um, uh, from the PT realm. Uh, and then I'll switch over to growth mixture modeling. And again, I want to rehash latent growth modeling quickly to catch everybody up on the same page. Um, and then we'll sort of combine what we talked in the first half with the mixture modeling with the latent growth modeling. And that'll get us to the growth mixture modeling. And then I'll walk through another example um, from the PT realm on that. Now we'll make the slides available and at the end, uh, we won't have time for this stuff, but I put in uh, slides on some more advanced models that are possible. And that is, they're sort of path diagrams with a couple sentences outlining sort of what's going on. 
Uh, and then at the very end, I put a it's probably like 10 slides on how the EM algorithm actually works. And that's sort of for the more tech side um, of this talk. I didn't want to get into too many equations in the actual presentation. Um, as my wife said that this talk sounded boring and I didn't want to get it any more. Uh, sort of two quick notes up front. So I, my background is in structural equation modeling. Um, and so I'm presenting this topic from that point of view um, with the primary sort of conceptual framework being provided by um, M plus, which is a software which sort of incorporates the um, latent variable mixture modeling, sort of the first one that was widely available to do so. And still, I think the easiest. Um, the other thing I wanna do is thank the PT faculty at Delaware. Um, this is sort of the group that has embraced this or I twisted their arm enough to allow me to do it with their data. It's another way of talking about that. I know earlier this year, uh, Darcy presented on the mixture modeling we had done for some of her data from her R01. In this uh, talk today, I'll be presenting growth mixture modeling from some data from Greg Hicks, who everybody should know now. And then uh, from Karin, uh, I will do a mixture model from her. And I wanted to highlight sort of the the co-conspirators of those labs, Allison, Pete, and Sean, for being sort of my primary contact in working with the data uh, from those labs. And specifically, Allison and Sean, uh, who did a directed study with me in the past fall and sort of made me get back into uh, deep diving into mixture modeling itself. So just up front, uh, there's a lot of confusion because there are a lot of names for similar techniques as well as a lot of names for this technique itself. Uh, we sort of have come to the point now where we typically call essentially what is the umbrella topic is latent variable mixture modeling, sometimes called just mixture modeling. It's sort of latent class analysis at the cross-sectional level and growth mixture modeling at the longitudinal level. Um, there are other names for the methods and they typically come from different fields or um, you can show that those techniques in the other fields are either mathematically equivalent or very similar. And you might hear terms like finite mixture modeling, Gaussian mixtures. And um, I would say something that's very related to mixture modeling is supervised and unsupervised learning. And mixture modeling is funky in a way it sits almost in between uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, just want to put up sort of the, one of the, seminal articles in this sense that um, it really popularized the method in terms of making it available for applied researchers it is a chapter from a book that Mutan had um, authored. He authored the chapter, not the book. Um, and you can see that initially they were giving a different name, sort of every combination that could be available in mixture modeling. And thankfully we have moved away from that towards the latent class is sort of cross-sectional and growth mixture modeling is sort of longitudinal, sort of covers all of those. Uh, just real quickly, notation for some of the stuff that's in the slide and the sample size. Y and Z are endogenous variables, that is their outcomes are predicted by another variable in the model. X is for exogenous variables, these are predictors only. Q is the total number of parameters in the model. K is the total number of classes. C is the variable uh, that it will be a latent variable. It sort of follows a multinomial distribution for the class itself, and little c would be the specific class in an equation. L is simply the likelihood, and you'll see here that I have p sort of hat is the posterior probability, and then p hat ic would be the posterior probability for the ith individual in class c. Um, it's pretty standard to use i for individuals and c for classes. Um, if you're coming from more of the cluster analysis, they use the K. Uh, so just a quick heads up on that. Uh, so now actually to the, to the start of the talk itself. So when we talk about latent variables, most often time people first touch this topic in principal components or exploratory factor analysis. And the whole idea is we're trying to get a measurement of some behavior that is, can't be directly measured. And so we have to indirectly get there using things that we think are related to that underlying construct. 
And so you'll see here I've used we're indirectly measuring them because they cannot be directly observed. And that is we want to use items we hypothesize to be related to the construct of interest. Um, in structural equation modeling, we call these items indicators. And one important thing to note is they don't have to be on the same scale. And what we're really interested in is what those individual items have in common. That is their shared variance. So you'll see a throwback to probably your first regression courses when we talked about the overlap of variance among variables. And you'll see here if you just picture each circle as the, the amount of variance, right, this is a conceptual representation. You'll see that xi1 is sort of the overlap of all three of the x's. And that is the that is the latent variable itself. That's what we want to get to. Now, one thing that makes sort of PCA different than, ex than exploratory factory and structural equation modeling is PCA, we typically say the items are creating the component. Um, we sort of flip that thinking in statistical modeling itself in terms of SEM is always from a hypothesized standpoint. And so what we think about in that terms is, that is the latent construct is causing or is driving the scores on the observed variables. Um, and in fact, the one way to conceptually think about the latent variable is the true score in classic test theory, where the observed score is a true score plus error. It's very similar to what we think about in structural equation modeling. And that is the observed value you find on a measure is a function of the standing on the latent trait and measurement error. And you'll see here, here's another PT example. I try to be consistent and use PT throughout. Um, here is a physical function latent concept, and it's made up of these five indicators. So timed up and go, Berg balance scale, blur balance scale, the functional gait assessment, six minute walk and self-selected walking speed. So, Immediately, you will know that those are not on the same scale, right? Six minute walk test is literally the distance you walk in six minutes. Self selected walking speed would be an actual velocity. And you'll see here that what we're representing, that is, those boxes, those are the observed values. And what we're saying is those scores that you observe there is a product of where you're standing on the physical function and the error. Now, this is typically where people. Uh, sort of leave latent variables is this is underlying continuous latent construct that we're trying to get to. Although there's no reason that the latent construct itself has to be continuous. That is, it could be categorical. And when you think about a continuous variable, right, it's a standing on some number line or some metric. But when we start classifying individuals, that is when it's categorical or nominal, we're grouping people together at a certain value or, or within a certain group. And so people typically think of latent categorical variables as unobserved subpopulations. And that the heterogeneity we're seeing in the observed data is actually caused by mixing these multiple uh, smaller subpopulations. Now in the literature, we call the subpopulations classes. So I'm gonna use that throughout, so that's indicators and classes. I'm just gonna adopt that language uh, for the rest of the talk. I um, mean, each class is coming from its own parent distribution, right, which represents its own population. And so if we just think back to the latent construct of physical function I had just described, it could be that physical function is continuous, or it could be that it's actually categorical. That is, their people perform well or poorly. Now, I don't know that to be the case in this sense. I'm just using that as an example. So what is the goal of mixture modeling? And that is to disambiguate those classes. That is, we want to find the classes that exist in the data. Importantly, if we know that those classes exist and we model them, right, we can account for potential biases and parameter estimates, standard errors, and at some point down the line, model fit. Um, we typically assume units come from multiple normal distributions. Um, there's mathematical attractability reasons, right? Everybody's familiar with the normal distribution, it has nice characteristics. Um, but you can use others. And just an example, M plus uh, includes ways to 
add a parameter for skewness, or you can flip to a T distribution to fatten up the tails, right, which affects the kurtosis, or you can add two um, uh, parameters to the model to do a skewed T distribution. Uh, cluster analysis in its face answers very similar research questions, and I'll get to that in a couple slides. And importantly, mixture modeling uses the expectation maximization algorithm. It's an iterative procedure, sort of similar to maximum likelihood. Initially, what you do is you start by choosing random locations. So in your mind, if you can picture a number line and a bunch of dots on there, we randomly choose a starting location, and then we find the probability that that point happens if they come from that distribution, which if we can consider normal distributions is pretty easy. If you think back to your very first stat one days, we did this with z-scores, right? We found out how likely a z-score is. Um, then we take that probability of belonging to that distribution. We apply Bayes' theorems, essentially saying how likely is that distribution given the, the overall sample that was collected. And that gives us a posterior probability. We then transform that posterior probability into a weight. And that is, we want each case to have a total probability of one across all classes. So that uh, very quickly is sort of the overlying or the underlying steps of the first um, step in the EM algorithm. What we then do is we can take those weights and we can recalculate a weighted mean and get a weighted variance. And then find out what the dis what the likelihood is for a point coming from that distribution. And we iteratively do this until you know, some convergence criteria is met. Typically, um, the posterior probabilities don't change you know, out to some nth degree. Uh, and we typically end on the maximum likelihood estimates. Uh, the other thing that you should know is most softwares will use multiple random starting locations to confirm results. So at the real 10,000 foot level, I just want to go over quickly why mixture modeling is a little different than clusters. And you'll see here that the two most popular cluster methods, the k-means and hierarchical. <clears throat> in mixture modeling, the posterior probabilities actually serve as weights. Whereas in k-means and hierarchical clustering, each individual is assigned to one cluster and one cluster alone. Mixture modeling has another advantage is that data can be at any level, so that's categorical, nominal, ratio, or interval at the same time. K-means needs the continuous data, that's interval or ratio, and hierarchical, that needs to be of the same type, so either categorical or continuous. Uh, the downside to mixture modeling is you can have convergence failure or estimation failure, whereas in the cluster analysis, you will always get a result. Uh, sort of the main benefit, I think, of mixture modeling is that it's model-based, which means that we can test for model fit as well as test for significant parameters itself. There are tests for picking K, that is the total number of class, uh, classes, and I'll get to that in a little bit, as well as you can embed that mixture model into a larger model. It can be part of a more theoretical model that you're testing from the sample. Um, and k-means and hierarchical clustering are sort of moving in the direction of becoming more rigorous for picking those things. That is, typically in k-means, we talk about how you have to know the number of clusters ahead of time, but there are informal tests for that. And in hierarchical, you don't have to specify, but there are tests for stopping the addition of new clusters. Uh, so now I would just want to go through some sort of graphical examples of mixtures sort of people can get a, you know, it's, I think it's easier to conceptualize when you actually see it. And I mean literally see it not in equation form, but in graphical form. So we'll just do a 1D example first. So we just take this frequency distribution uh, of X2 in this case, and you'll see that the distribution is not normal or it doesn't look normal. And so what we would say in mixture modeling is that this non-normality is caused by a mix of normal distributions. And so you could sort of see how the three sort of normal distributions on the right make up the, dis the overall joint distribution on the left. 
And that is we could say these three latent classes, right, all have a normal distribution that are combining to make what we see in the frequency uh, histogram for X2. And, right, and if we overlay the normal distribution sort of images on top of it, uh, you'll see that that's sort of apparent. Again, this is simulated data, uh, so some forgiveness from you guys, please. So that's sort of in one dimension, right? It's sort of easy to conceptualize how a non-normal distribution could be made up of a mix of multiple normal distributions coming from different classes. <clears throat> Uh, one thing to note is that the class in this sense is latent, right? It's not observed. All we know is they're standing on X2. And given that, we're trying to infer what class they came from. Uh, so let's move to a 2D example. This is sort of, um, it's much longer to go through, uh, and you'll see why in a minute. And it sort of starts with the research question, a basic one is, what if we want to know how X3 and X4 are related, or if they are related? And the first thing most statisticians will do is look at the scatter plot. And you'll see here that there is a, you know, pretty strong positive correlation between the two. And if you keep looking at it, you'll wonder to yourself that there's sort of an increased density of points in sort of two different areas of the graph. And that is we're looking at two sort of groups, right? And I'm just going to use groups uh, loosely right now. But it looks like we sort of have a low, low group. That is, right, you're lower on X3 and you tend to be lower on X4, and a high, high group, which would be higher on X3 and higher on X4. And there's sort of this lack of density in between the two, which, you know, would cause some people to think, well, there might be multiple populations here. And given that this is a topic... This talk is a topic on mixture modeling, right? That's the approach we're going to take. And so the first step would be to check the univariate distributions of each of these variables to see what's going on. And if we look at the univariate distributions, it becomes apparent why you could see a low, low group and a high, high group, right? Both these distributions seem to have or be a mix of two classes of a low sort of normal and a high normal. And so that makes sense of what we saw. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind is we're dealing with joint distribution here. And so we really need to look at the bivariate space. And so what does the joint histogram look like? And so here is the joint hist frequency histogram. Um, it's sort of hard to pick an X and a Z, depending on your perspective here, but Y itself is still the frequency or the count. And so one way to think about what we were just looking at is we had a low, low group and a high, high group. And so what if we just split sort of the scales in half and said if you're low at less than 25 in both X and X3 and X4, right, you're in one sort of class and everybody else is in the other. And so what does that look like? Uh, and so here is that histogram. And so um, you'll have to, again, forgive the sort of crudeness of the example, but if you're if you've seen a three-dimensional um, normal distribution before, right, as in in two dimensions, you could see how that blue group, right, the low low, sort of looks like it come could come from a normal distribution or multivariate normal in this case, right, two dimensions. But that green one certainly does not look like it, right. That high high group does not look like it could be coming from a normal distribution. And what's happening is it looks like there tends to be some skewness towards having a high X3 but a low X4. And so what, one way to account for that, again, is to add another normal distribution, right? So now we have a low, low group, a high, high group, and a low, high group, or a high, low group, depending on how you want to think about it. And now when you look at it, you can sort of see that these three groups come from normal distribution. Now let's go back to the original research question is, what's the relationship between X3 and X4? Now given that we know that there's multiple potential classes going on, that is how would the classes fit into the scatter plot we saw? Well, we know initially we thought there was a low, low group and a high, high group. 
uh, for teaching didactic purposes, you can all assume or pretend to assume that that's what you did. Uh, but now we also found, right, because that green distribution looks skewed, that we actually might have a high-low group or low-high group, depending on how you want to think about it. And so where would that appear on the graph? And so we need to sort of repicture how the graph might look with a low-low group, a high-high group, and a low-high group, or a high-low group, depending on how you want to look at the last one. And you'll see here that I've depicted that, uh, given the clouds again. And then we want to think about how the relationship between X3 and X4 now is class dependent, right? That is, class moderates this relationship. And so if we were to know class ahead of time, our conclusion about how X3 and X4 changes pretty drastically. Initially, right, when we looked at the whole scatter plot without class information, we thought it was strongly positively correlated. If we know class information, Right? We can see that in the low, low group, there's a sort of moderate positive correlation. In the high, high group, there's a strong positive correlation. And in the low, high group, or the high, low group, there's actually a negative correlation. <clears throat> so that leads us toward the next step is, well, what if we ran a mixture model in this data? What will we actually find? Uh, so I went and did that, and again, this is simulated data. Um, so one of the things that you can do in running the mixture model itself is, because you get the predicted probability of being in a class, you can then assign individuals to those classes and get sort of um, parameter estimates that represent the distribution that it is most likely to come from. And so you'll see here, here's a table that presents the classes and proportions. And so in the first class, it has assigned 18 people, in the second, 44, and in the third, uh, 98. And then over here is sort of a an image of the actual parameters that would be going about being representing that class or that mixture. And you'll see in the first class, X3 is high at 32, and X4 is sort of in the middle at 19. You'll see that for class two, we have sort of a higher in both, or I should say higher in X4, but not quite in X3. That's 28 and 31. And then in class three, you can see that there's sort of a low, low, right? Which is X3 mean of 10 and X4 mean of 12. And we can ask how well did this uh, mixture model actually do? Well, I'll give you the simulated data itself. That is, these are, this is what I use to create the simulated data. Um, the first thing to draw your attention to is the bold, and that is the group sizes themselves. So I simulated 140 and 20, and you'll notice below that we got 98, 44, and 18. So pretty close. You'll see that my group one was the low, low group. And so that's sort of, it's pretty representative of class three. My quote unquote high, high group is representative of class two, and class one was the low, high group. And you'll see that those means actually came out pretty close. Um, because I simulated the data, I knew that we were going to end up on three classes, right? Because I simulated three groups before I combined them into one. But there are ways to test how many actual classes we should extract from the data or what we should be looking for. And so that's what I want to talk about next in terms of uh, practicality. This is, you know, you would think the most complicated part, um, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it becomes pretty obvious and it jumps out at you. So because mixture modeling is a statistical model or is embedded in a statistical model, we can use fit criteria and objective tests to determine the optimal number of classes. There are two things that we can't do objectively though, and that is we want to be conscious of class size, and we typically want to avoid small class sizes. One with smaller class sizes, right, variability tends to be larger, and uh, the parameter estimates themselves tend to be less stable when generalizing to a larger population. And as importantly, um, we want to make sure that we have a theoretical foundation of why these decisions are being made. 
which goes back to sort of the underlying idea of SEM is there's a hypothesized model and we should be keeping that in mind. Um, and we typically say that that's based on substantive theory. Um, and in a little bit, the example I go through will show how that actually came out to help us in the picking the number of classes in our first example. Um, so in terms of fit criteria, they're probably the fit criteria that you're used to seeing uh, if you do any sort of mixed modeling or modeling. We have our AIC, our BIC, your sample size adjusted BIC, and you typically want the lowest value indicates the best fit. Um, again, because we're working with statistical models, we can do model tests, and specifically we can use a likelihood ratio test. And what we're saying here is that we have nested models, and that is a model with C classes has nested within it a model of C minus one classes. And so we can actually take the ratio of those likelihoods, right, and do negative two times the log likelihood. Um, so essentially what that test is testing is if adding an additional class significantly improves model fit. And if it does not improve model fit significantly, we typically say to go with the simpler or more parsimonious model. Uh, there is a bootstrap version of this test available. Uh, it's pretty computationally demanding. And of course there's uh, adjustments that have been made and in this case, you can adjust for sample size and the total number of classes that you're extracting. So there's also an, an alternative way to think about fitting one of these models. And that is, how well do the mixtures work at the individual level? That is, if the classes themselves are more distinct, there should be a higher posterior probability of being assigned to a class than equal across the classes. This type of thinking is common in IRT, in person fit statistics. Uh, and in you know, mixture models, we typically use what's called entropy, which is bounded between zero and one, and is roughly sort of conceptually thought of as uh, the probability of being assigned to the most likely class given you came from the most likely class. So now let's walk through uh, the first example. So in Achilles tendinopathy, um, there tends to be a lot of clinical uh, presentation that is heterogeneous across people. And in terms of people that don't know what tendinopathy is, it's essentially a tendon injury that's not rupture, is essentially what we're saying here. Um, the presence of these unrecognized classes or subgroups, right, will help explain why there's such a varied response of treatment, why there could be high recurrence rates, and really support the need for individualized treatments, right? We all, we wanna move medicine towards that prescriptive individualistic to maximize efficiency and effect. So this is 145 participants. They completed a baseline evaluation of 17 variables across five domains. Um, and the domains are sort of identified uh, by the substantive virtues, uh, researchers that I was working with. And they, uh, they sort of identify demographic characteristics, which are patient related, uh, symptoms, function, that is literally how well you can do activity on the injured Achilles or using the injured Achilles. There's also a psych side, that is if your fear of movement and pain catastrophizing. And then there's actual physical properties of the tendon itself. So you can see these 17 variables are a wide range of different things. And we're trying to get as broad and as encompassing we can so that the classes themselves are very representative. So using these 17 variables, we ran um, the mixture model and we did so for a number of classes and I'm just gonna narrow in sort of on uh, two, three, and four. And you'll see here that based on fit statistics, the AIC, BIC, and SSBIC suggested three classes. The likelihood ratio test seemed to say that two classes is significantly better than one, three is not quite significantly better than two, uh, and four is for sure not better than three. Entropy is close among all three, but typically is sort of suggesting two classes. 
Um, when it's split like this, we often, uh, or I should say, the bootstrap uh, likelihood ratio test was unhelpful. Um, that is, no matter how many classes we did it, it was coming out significant. Um, in this instance, it was useful to talk with the researchers and come up with substantive theory on why two or three classes would be important. Um, and I want to go through on how that sort of happened. Um, and that really is sort of a natural flow to the next topic, which is how do you differentiate classes? How do you make sense of what you've actually found? Um, or, you know, in parlance, is what are we going to call them? Uh, my first advice is let the content expert choose the names uh, so you don't step in anything that you don't know about. Um, but primarily what we can do is we can compare the indicators across classes, and that is compare means of continuous ones and frequencies of categorical data. Again, this is actually done through the mixture modeling itself. So these follow-up tests, it's not like we're now data diving that we need to run uh, corrected alpha adjustments for it. So for the example we just had, five variables were not significantly different among classes, so I'm not going to talk about those. And we came up with three classes, and I'll tell you why we went with three over two. So the first class is they called the high loaders. These people tended to be, quote unquote, better off. And we'll see what that means shortly. They were younger, they had lower BMI, and they were able to do the most heel rise, the most heel rises. And that is literally the physical act of lifting yourself um, off the ground on the one injured leg. The second class is what we, or they called symptom focused, and that is they had lower overall functional performance than the high loaders, and they had really awful psych measures and quality of life. <clears throat> and the third group uh, we call the structurally impaired, and that is this group had similar function as the symptom focus, so worse off than the high loaders, but their psych measures were actually more similar to the high loaders than the symptom focus, and they had the worst tendon structure, that is the physical properties of the tendon itself. Now the two class solution was combining the symptom focus and the structurally impaired. So it was essentially saying high loaders and everybody else. But when you actually go through and start looking at some of these indicators for the classes, it really seems like the symptom focus and structurally impaired are different. And so I just wanna walk through sort of how we determine that. So again, this is sort of an ugly uh, graphic to look at because there's a lot of numbers going on. So the first thing is the shaded columns are high loaders on the left, that is their average, and the p-values associated with comparisons to the high loaders. What I specifically want to draw your eyes to first are the green font, and you'll see that the high loaders did a lot more work than the symptom focus and structurally impaired. Next, I want to draw your attention to the blue text, and that is the quality of life and the two psych measures. And you'll see that that middle group did worse, much worse than the other two groups, especially when you're looking at the psych measures. You can see that the high loaders, kinesophobia was a 36, structurally impaired was a 38, which is pretty close. Symptom focus was a 41. When you went down to pain, pain catastrophizing, it was a six and a five versus a nine. And lastly, I wanna call your attention to the red text, which is the structurally impaired. And that is the physical measurements of the tendon itself really separated that third group from the second group. And you can see how that second group's actual physical measurements are pretty similar to the high loaders. Uh, now we understand that tables are often hard to pull um, broad strokes from and can be difficult to interpret. So I wanna go through some ways of graphically representing what we did um, and it might make it more intuitive. Uh, the first thing to know is I've rescaled, or at least Sean rescaled, all the variables. And that is, from now on out in the next couple of uh, images, the more positive a value is, the better it is. And we put everything on the same scale itself. That is, we put everything on z-scores so they could belong in the same um, plots. Um, and they also color-coded based on those domains. So you'll see at first this very bright colored and busy plot. Um, it can be hard to interpret on its own, 
uh, but when I walk through it, it's going to make uh, pretty clear sense. You'll see on the far left is high loaders. In the middle is the symptom focus, and on the right is the structurally impaired. And those were all the measures listed there that were significantly different among them. So when we just highlight all of them at once, you can sort of see that, in general, high loaders are doing better across almost all the outcomes than the other two groups. Then when we talk about the uh, symptom focus folks, right, we had mentioned that their psych and their quality of life was worse. Well, you can look at the red solid line, the red dotted line, and the orange solid line for those three measures. And again, if I highlight them on the graph, right, it makes it more apparent that they are doing worse in those variables. And then lastly, we have the structurally impaired group. Um, and this is quite easy to see how different they are if we look at the purple. And that is those physical measurements. And you can see that they do much worse than the other two groups. Um, another way of sort of graphically depicting what's going on is using a radar or a spider plot. Um, so again, in this case, uh, everything was rescaled so that it was similar. And in this case is, the closer you are to the center, the better off you are. And each of the gray rings is about a quarter of a uh, z-score worse. So overall, we can look at the high loaders on the left and show that there's not a lot of area being covered. That is, they're doing pretty well on all of the uh, metrics. But how to differentiate between the symptom focus and structurally impaired? Well, let's talk about the psych measures first, right? We can see that the strike measures in the symptom focus are stronger or they're worse than the structurally impaired. Same with quality of life. And then we can do the same thing for the actual measures of, of tendon structure itself. Uh, we can highlight that and show that that is quite different. Um, so although the sort of the fit criteria and the tests were split between uh, two and three classes, um, given these results, it really looked like there were three different sort of presentations of tendinopathy, in this case, three classes. Uh, so now I want to shift focus a little bit uh, to talk about latent growth modeling uh, briefly. And then we will combine what we've just talked about in late growth modeling with the mixture modeling to talk about growth mixture modeling. And so what is latent growth modeling? And why do we sort of want to talk about change over time in that perspective? Well, the same way that we talked about trying to get error-free measurement with latent variables, the same thing can be done with growth modeling. And that is, in this case, instead of each uh, observation, in this case y, is a function of two latent variables and measurement error. And if we can get to these estimates without measurement error, right, we're trying to reduce the bias. The two latent variables that we typically talk, talk about is an, an estimate of initial standing, which would be the intercept, and the change over time, which is the slope. And sort of jointly, we refer to them as the growth parameters. Um, and again, the actual observed value, what we're saying is people's initial standing and their change over time are plus measurement error are exactly what we're seeing on the observed values. Now, you could do growth modeling through either the mixed modeling framework or the latent growth structural equation modeling side. Um, they both have advantages and disadvantages, um, but mathematically, they are essentially equivalent uh, with some slight differences. Um, if you have approached growth modeling from the mixed model, right, we often talk about fitting a mean model and then a subject specific model. That is a de deviation for each group from the mean. We're still doing the same thing in structural equation modeling. That is, we're considering the, the intercept and the slope as continuous latent variables. Right? In mixed modeling, we'd be talking about those as random effects if we want to estimate their variances. And again, in mixed modeling, it's very common to have models where you're just looking at the random intercept model, or you can add random slopes, or you can have neither, and just sort of model the covariance matrix of the errors, 
right? That's the sort of the ways you can do uh, growth modeling in mixed models. Uh, one assumption is that the distribution of the slopes and the intercepts is the same for all individuals. But what are some advantages of actually doing growth modeling? Why would we do this versus a classic repeated measures ANOVA or within subjects ANOVA? So one, we can have unequally spaced measurements in time. Then you have time varying covariates. You can spe directly specify the covariance matrix of the errors, right? We all know that compound symmetry is hard to meet in practice uh, if you want to do some sort of mixed design or within subjects ANOVA. Uh, and we can also accommodate missing data without list-wise deletion. So I'm often, um, when I talk about these models with individuals, people are always like, what does random intercepts and slopes mean? So I just want to briefly catch people up because that terminology will be used in, in the context of growth mixture modeling. And so here again, I've just simulated data and it's, um, we have four time points, a baseline, you know, time uh, plus one, plus two, and plus three. And what do we mean when we're talking about random intercepts and random slopes? Well, primarily we're talking about the variability. And that is, there is some distribution of intercepts and we want to actually look at the variance of this because each of those people is coming from a broad distribution and they represent that distribution. And that is, there's a distribution of intercepts and slopes. Now it's easy sort of to show the distribution of intercepts on the plot as I have here. It is not as easy to depict what a distribution of slopes looks like. Um, but I went and did that and here are literally the distribution of intercepts and slopes. So they do exist. Um, the other th reasons for talking about growth modeling in the sense from latent variables or from mixture modeling is it is they're pretty flexible procedures. So we don't have to assume linear growth. We can add a quadratic factor. That's easy to do in mixed modeling, easy to do in structural equation modeling. You can do piecewise models. That is growth over time can be a function of multiple linear components. It's not super easy to do in mixed modeling, but you can do it. Uh, it requires three or more time points. Uh, SEM actually has this additional flexibility of you can do unstructured growth, which is it actually estimates when it thinks the third time point would be, that is it, it optimizes it. I've never seen that in practice and I'm not really 100% sure how you would interpret that always because what it is is it's picking where the time point it would be regardless of when you actually uh, ran, those, ran those measurements. I would say overall that doing this in SEM is more flexible, but at the, at the same time, it's more complicated to run and interpret. Um, one thing that is sort of difficult in the SEM framework is the actual covariance matrix of the errors has to be specified um, sort of on a pairwise. Um, I don't wanna say, on a, on a, you have to do each pair individually. You can't just specify a matrix itself. Right, which can be complicated to do. Um, but I would say that it offers some larger advantages. And that is, what if this piece of growth was actually just a tiny part of a larger model? What if you had a distal outcome that was only measured once? So you had all these repeated measures and an outcome that was measured once. That's quite difficult to do in a mixed model. It's easy in SEM. Um, and so that is sort of the distal outcome. The parallel process, would be like a multivariate uh, mixed model, which is not super easy to work with either, but it's quite easy in the SEM framework. So I just wanna show you what I mean by it's a flexible model. So you can see here, this is the same growth model if you ignore the X's for a second that we saw before. And that is the Y's are a function of the latent variables of intercept and slope and error. We're still assuming linear growth here, but now I've correlated the intercept and the slope. And that would be like a slope intercept interaction in a mixed model. I've also added a covariate predicting initial standing, right? So that's the conditional model. And we now have slope predicting a distal latent factor that was maybe measured at time point five, right? That was a latent factor itself made up of two items. So to do this model in SEM is actually not much harder than to do the actual linear growth model but to do all this in the mixed model would be quite difficult. 
Uh, so now let's take what we just talked about in terms of longitudinal modeling and add the mixture that we did before and we come to growth mixture modeling. And so what we're doing here is adding that latent categorical variable for class. And essentially what we're doing is we're fitting a growth model for each class separately. And we're seeing if that is significantly improves fit, right? That is, do classes moderate what the growth is over time? Now we typically always allow the means to vary among classes or else why would you have multiple classes? Um, the important things in terms of actually doing the modeling itself is what are you gonna do about the variances of the intercept and slope? And we can do sort of one of three things for each of those. We can fix them to a specific value, typically zero, that is we're not estimating that. And so if we fix the slope variance to zero, <clears throat> but let the intercept variance be estimated, then we're talking about a random intercept model that I that we had just reviewed in the growth modeling section. Um, you could constrain these to be equivalent across classes. That is, you can assume that these individuals come from a growth parameter distribution that's the same. Um, or you could freely estimate these from each class, or of course you can do some combination of the above. Now, why would you fix versus free parameters? Well, obviously fixing things to zero and restricting them makes simpler models. The downside of that is sometimes you extract extra classes uh, because of those restrictions that you've applied. Where on the flip side, freeing parameters creates computational burden and it's much harder to generalize, right? Because eventually you might get to the point where you're overfitting a model. Um, Again, one of the nice things, because the growth mixture modeling is within the statistical model itself, you can test if constraining and freeing parameters improves model fit. So I wanna talk about the first sort of uh, growth mixture modeling that is common in the literature. It has been called latent trajectory analysis, latent class growth analysis. Um, you might also have heard uh, semi-parametric growth modeling is another name for it. And what we're doing is we're fixing the variances and the covariance of the growth parameters to zero. And so we're assuming with, within class homogeneity of the growth parameters. Um, <clears throat> that really simplifies the model itself, although it could be violating what you know to be happening in practice. At the complete other end of the spectrum is a full growth mixture modeling. That is, we're estimating all parameters freely and what we're saying is the variance and the covariance of the factors are allowed to differ across classes and that each class comes from its own sort of parent distribution. Uh, somewhere in between those is a constrained or partial growth mixture model. And that is we're either constraining some of the parameters to be equivalent across classes or fixing some to zero and freely estimating others. And when I talk about it in the terms of slides like this, um, that could be sort of quite confusing and hard to imagine what is going on. So I just wanted to have a quick example of a syntax that actually sort of shows what's going on. <clears throat> so here is a syntax for a four class um, latent uh, variable growth mixture modeling. You'll see initially up top, there is a overall model, right? Conveniently labeled overall. The I and the S stand for intercept and slope. And so what we're, what that keys for, uh, this is M plus software, is that to use the next group of variables listed as your measurements over time. And after the at sign assigns the value that we're looking at in the time space. So in this case, what we're saying is at zero, at one, at two, at four, we're saying that there's unequal, unequal time points. And in this case, it was a measure at baseline three, six, and 12 months. And so if that 12 month measurement was at nine months, right, we would have used zero, one, two, and three. Then underneath that, you'll see that there's a C num pound one, C pound two, C pound three, C pound four. So this is four classes, and that is literally a model for each class. In brackets, to be the same between classes, you wouldn't need multiple classes. 
the I and the S alone on its own line is the variance, and that's the idea of random slope or random intercept variance, whether we want to add that to the model. And the width is the covariance between them, and that is that intercept-slope interaction. So you'll see that three of the classes are random intercept models. You'll see that I've fixed the S variance to zero, as well as, um, actually, if you fix the S variance to zero, you automatically have no covariance between the two because it's zero. There's nothing to covary I with. But you'll see here that class two is slightly different, and class two actually has its intercept variance fixed to zero. So essentially what we're saying in this model is that there are four classes present. Three of them follow a random intercepts sort of approach, and the other one is a latent trajectory model, and that is everybody within that class sort of has the same intercept. Um, so now let me talk about the example itself. Um, this is lower back pain example. This is 245 older adults with chronic lower back pain. Uh, and they wanted to see if there were subgroups in the change over time for three different variables. And that is the Quebec back pain disability scale, and then two component scores from the LLFDI, the functional and disability. We just saw syntax from one of the functional models. And I'm going to talk about the disability ones here, and you'll see why that I'm only going to go through one. Um, keep in mind that there were four time points, baseline, three months, six months, and 12 months. I looked at two through six classes for all three outcomes, and I considered three different growth mixture models. So it ended up, ended up being for disability 21 growth models itself, um, which is why these can be complicated to do in practice. So how do we get down to, how do we pick a model? Well, there were some things that sort of um, became self-evident quickly, and that is anytime we tried, or I tried to estimate slope variance, there was a failure of model convergence. Or we estimated it and the slope variance was not significantly different than zero. And therefore, setting the slope, the variance to zero, right, removing random slope for time in this sense, in this case, um, is what happened, and that is that fit the model. Now, because the variability of slope was fixed to zero, there was no covariance between the intercept and slope because there was nothing to covariate intercept with. Although, um, we did consider, in this case, the random intercept models. And I did two sets, sort of, random intercept models. One is treating time as equally spaced, and that is just successive measurements get one more, right? Z baseline one, two, and three. Uh, and I did five models for that because that's two through six classes. And then one is time is unequally spaced, so that's zero, one, two, and four. That is taking into account that where you'd think the next measurement would be nine months, it was actually 12 months. And again, that was five models, and that's two through six classes. And then sort of the third sense of the mixture model, um, the growth mixture model that I fit, was what I called fully fitted, in the sense that it was more um, getting model fit exactly for what would be the best estimates for each specific case. That is, in each number of classes. So I considered time unequally spaced, and I started with the variability freed for every class for the intercept. And then I iterated through until I found the best fitting model. So what I mean there is, take the four class example. I started with a model that had, each class had its random intercept. And then I fixed one of the intercepts to zero and reran the model and see if it significantly, um, if the, essentially the nested model, that is, the model with the four freed intercepts was significantly better fitting than the model with three intercepts and one fixed. Um, and then, so I cycled through that, so again, four would have, compared to three, um, if that was significant, I compared to three to two, and two to one. Um, and again, two to six classes. Um, now, something slightly different happened here, five and six classes was inestimable. That is, um, I couldn't actually get convergence on those, um, and so you'll see in the table that I'm about to present that I've read those out. Um, but what happened in the fitted model 
is that for two, three, and four classes, essentially what happened is one of those classes required random intercepts or significantly improved model fit by including random intercepts, and the others didn't. And I'll talk about in a minute why that was. So the first thing, right, so now we have two through six classes for these three different types of models. And we wanted to look at model fit overall. And the first thing I wanted to do is you have to figure out how many classes you want to extract and which model to go with. And so when you put these results in a table, it becomes pretty evident that four classes fits regardless of which model we're talking about. And so that was sort of the first step of narrowing down what, what to do. Um, and after deciding on four classes, right, we can then compare the AIC, BIC, and SSBIC, as well as the entropy, because they're not nested tests. So we can compare those fit across the three types of models. And you'll see here that the equal model actually had the lowest AIC, BIC, SSBIC, and the entropy was pretty close across the three. Um, because of this, we chose to go with the equally spaced and four classes. And so here are the results. And the first thing I want to um, sort of two notes to talk about here. One is what is depicted are the means over time, but that is the posterior probability means. And that is an individual that was 90% likely to be in the first group. Well, 90% of their score, right, is in that mean. Now, the graph is slightly lying in the sense that uh, the ends are below, and that would be the end if you assign people to the most likely class. So that's not exactly what is depicted, but it was sort of uh, easy to share results that way. So you'll see here that we had sort of a static high group, a static moderate group, and we said moderate because the, the disability limitation score itself goes from 0 to 100, and you can see that, that what you might think of as a low group is at 65. Then we had a moderate improving group and a high uh, declining group. Now you'll think back to what I was saying before was in the fitted model, it, it was essentially saying that there is one class that needed random intercepts. And you'll see down below, if you look at the ends, there is one class that is much larger than the others. And that is the class that uh, random intercepts would help improve model fit by including. Now, uh, just to be 100% sure of what was going on, I then took the four class solution and ran that as um, sort of fitted with equal time spacing too, so not one of the ones I measured. And again, uh, the results were not better than the equally uh, space time that we got here, so we stuck with this. So one of the nice things about the growth mixture modeling though is that it's easy to label the groups, right? You just talk about where they start and what happens over time. So there's static, uh, high, static, moderate, static, low. You can do improving and declining. So in practice, some of the things that you need to sort of be cognizant of when you're doing the growth mixture modeling, we're typically running two through five classes, sometimes six. Uh, I've seen one seven in the literature. I've never seen anybody else approach that many. Um, and recall for each class, there's three growth parameters that we're talking about. There's three... Uh, variances and covariances to fix, constrain, or estimate freely. Also keep in mind how are we going to estimate the growth itself? Is it linear, quadratic, piecewise? Um, are we going to consider time equally spaced or unequally spaced? And then importantly, is this part of a larger model? Do you have variables that you need to adjust for? And are there variables that you need to predicting for, which we typically call a distal outcome? I would say overall the goal is to get the most parsimonious model that fits and makes substantive sense is sort of the goal. In actual practice, it makes sense to run a growth model for the entire sample first, so ignoring clus uh, the clustering or class classes that exist initially. And that can help you determine um, how you want to consider growth itself. Is it linear or quadratic? Then you can run the most restrictive model, which is the latent trajectory. That is no random intercepts, no random slopes. Uh, you can check for convergence issues that way, as well as find outlier classes. Uh, if you see three people are constantly 
being uh, made its own class, you might want to look to see why those three are very different than everybody else. And then just sort of a practical advice is I would start with a constrained and slowly free parameters as opposed to starting with everything fully freed and restricting. Um, and at the same time, in between each of these steps, if you have other covariates that you need to predict or adjust for, you should be doing that at each step. Uh, so I just want to thank you guys for listening to me drone on and on about uh, growth mixture modeling. And I'm assuming there might be questions or not. Thank you so much, Ryan. This is fascinating as always. And again, I learned, I learned a lot. Um, are there any questions for Ryan? I guess we are a little behind in time. Yeah, sorry for running late. No, no problem. Um, this is Dave Chen. I always have questions and I have quite a few um, have been working on a project using latent class analysis and exploring that in the context of violence as well as other sorts of things. And I think one really challenging thing is, um, in addition to trying to figure out numbers of classes, uh, trying to understand what are the pertinent variables to involve, mm -hmm. and then how um, local independence as an assumption um, how how necessary that is and how flexible that is with modeling. And I'm very new to this field and I feel like this question comes up is how do you know whether something is locally independent or not between um, variables and how important is that and how much can that be adjusted for with a different type of model selection? Yeah, I don't think there's a good answer for you yet, <laughs> right? I'm, not, I'm sure that's not what you wanted to hear. Um, it's what I expected, but <laughs> well, um, some ways to think about that are depending on what what variables you think are related a priori. You could typically um, maybe run a PCA and extract the principal component to include. Um, the other thing I didn't talk about here is nothing says that you have to make the classes based on observed variables. So you can construct latent variables first and then run the classes on those if you think there are a number of related uh, indicators. Does that help, Dave? Yes. Um, and I, I think also related to that is in terms of the construction of classes and, and, and thinking through them, um, I've also seen distinctions between doing essentially exploratory uh, analysis as compared to confirmatory. And it seems a lot of the times sample size is limiting and having essentially something where there's not that much missing data present um, to be able to look at those variable sets. Um, <laughs> this is a huge question in itself, but um, how do you generally approach using an exploratory analysis and then using that information to then move on towards a confirmatory analysis? Yeah, I'm gonna take the cheap way out in here and I don't really do exploratory modeling. <laughs> <laughs> Probably for that reason itself. Um, my colleague in uh, the Biostats core, Barry Bott, is more of the exploratory um, data analysis guy. Um, so anytime that type of thing comes up, I direct that research to him. Fair enough, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> so Dave, we, we can ask Barry. Uh... You know, he's part of the of the CTR call. So, so if you have a question, we'll be happy to. Uh, maybe he's there to ask Barry what he does. Looks like Barry is on. I'm not sure if he hears us. Yeah, I didn't. I should have. Uh let him know that I was going to send any hard questions his way before the talk. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm parallel processing here. I, I heard my name used in vain, but that's, that's it. <laughs> if, uh, I'm, I'm working on something else at the same time. I, I did hear there was a question. If the uh, if, if the individual wants to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to discuss anything with them. 
Thank you, Barry. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, all right. Well, I think we are going to close. And uh, thank you again, Ryan. And if you have uh, if any uh, any other questions, if you want to uh, ask any other questions to Ryan, you know, I'm, I'm sure you will be happy to answer by mail, right? Email. Yes. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you for attending this uh, wonderful tech talk. Thanks again, Ryan. Thank you.